Hello YouTube. The adventure within the mind of Marcus Aurelius is nearing its end. And I am presenting today the last episode of The Educated Barbarian dedicated on the meditations. I'm not stopping the series, of course, but this is our last segment on this book. And for today, just like I did with Diaga Cure, I want to present to you a collection of my favorite excerpts from the book, things that might not have been covered yet, and all in all, a conclusion to that particular topic. But keep in mind that we're moving on to more stoic lectures afterwards, none of which will be as long as the meditations. This was the longest analysis yet, but for a good reason, this book is beyond words. It is truly a, a piece of literature that can be revisited 15 times and you'll be rediscovering new things every single time. So if you haven't yet, I highly encourage you to read it. Everything is priceless. The information and the, the spirituality that you can get from it will change your life if you apply it and if you are managing to actually absorb it and make it your own. But let's put that aside because it's something I've already preached that the idea that stoicism is extremely beneficial and I'm going to actually demonstrate it with a few quotes that I think are going to resonate with you. It is very possible to be a god among men and yet be recognized by none. Remember that always, and this as well, that the happiness of life lies in very few things. And though you despair of becoming great in logic or in science, you need not despair of becoming a free man, full of modesty and unselfishness. So the first idea is, of course, that you don't become great for others or the recognition of others. You do it for yourself and for the community that you're going to better. You need to keep that in mind. Too many people do things to be praised, never fall into that trap. You do things for what you perceive to be good, regardless of that, that definition. And that, across the board, will carry you forward. And when you do that, you need not worry about whether you're progressing or not. You will be progressing. As you are going to elevate yourself spiritually, your talent and your abilities are going to as well, because it works as a whole. It works as, works as a unit. You are going to be a better person in both abilities and sensibilities. It is in your power to live superior to all violence, and in the greatest kind of mind were all men to rail against you as they pleased. I've said that in the past, confidence is, and strength to me, strength of character, that is, is being placed in a room with a thousand people that disagree with you and being completely untouched, meaning that you are not feeling attacked because you are confident in who you are and what you believe. And that can be applied to any situation and to the entire world. Once you know that you're doing something that is right, you stay that path. You don't deviate, not for one person, not for 10 millions, because this is your soul. It's the expression of who you are. You cannot let other people change it. It is ridiculous that you flee, not from the vice that is in yourself, as you have it in your power to do, but are still striving to flee from the vice in others, which you can never do. So the idea is that we are quick to judge others, and we are especially quick to try and dis distantiate ourselves to preserve our own life. But what we don't do, however, is do the same with vices. And what Marcus Aurelius tells you is that a vice is not you. It's not an expression of you. It is like a parasite in you. And though it could be a pure expression of the self and something that is quote unquote natural or a biological inclination, it does not mean you don't have the power to repress it. Actually, that power is what makes you human. And if you refuse to make use of it, you're not human anymore. So instead of focusing too much on trying to push people away, push the vices away instead. Focus on the value of the vice that you're rejecting. It is fine to push people away who are toxic, what you're pushing away is the vice. I'm actually going to get the, the light for this one. So you focus on the, the value itself and not the person, right? Because if you can actually chase and hunt the value, it's going to also work for yourself. When you have done a kind action, another has benefited. Why do you, like the fools, require some third thing in addition, a reputation for benevolence or return for it? Again, the, the idea that when you do something good, 
it needs to be good because you believe it is. And if it does good for someone else, then it's a byproduct of it. You do not need a retribution and you should never seek one. It is an, it's a, a deeply impure behavior and it's going to corrupt you because it's going to have you start doing good things because you are going to get a kickback out of it. And eventually you're going to stop doing it because it's good. You'll do it because of the kickback. Refuse the kickback. Refuse the retribution. That is being humble. Some people will see that as ego. Disregard that. It's for your own sake. It's to preserve yourself. It is deeply important. Because if you lose the ability to be a good person just to be a good person, you are going to go down a dark path. This is the literal definition of corruption. When you have... Sorry. No man worries of what brings him gain, and your gain lies in acting, according to nature. Be not worried, therefore, of gaining by the act which gives others gains. Simple. Never be afraid to do the right thing. Society as a whole, especially right now, is really, really pushing the concept of moral relativism, which is the, question, the constant questioning of everything. But notice I said questioning and not exploring. Because it's just contrarianism. It's just trying to look at everything that we take as good and say, okay, this is bad. But if you try to ask them how or why, they don't have an answer. They're just trying to deconstruct things, but they don't understand the, the process. They don't, they don't deconstruct by things. They just deconstruct. They're like some madman that you give a few tools that just starts to destroy houses and cars. He doesn't have a, has a, pur have a purpose. He's just doing that to do it. That is a terrible mindset, of course. Don't let yourself be affected by it. Do the right thing. Men will go their ways nonetheless, though you burst in pro protest. The idea that what I just said, the action of doing good for the good of society, cannot be done in confrontation with someone, meaning that you cannot complain that someone has vices. You can do two things. You can disregard it or you can fight it, but you cannot complain. Complain is passive and in reality, you cannot fight vices with passivity. You need to be either avoidant or actively seeking it out and hunting and trying to destroy it. But complaining does nothing. It actually feeds the vice in, uh, in most cases. You like leisure for reading, but leisure to repress or insolence you do not like. You have leisure to keep yourself superior to pleasure and pain and vain glory, to restrain all anger against the, the ungrateful, nay, even to lavish loving care upon them. So this is correlated with the idea that to be a stoic, for example, to have those values, you need to read. And therefore, if you don't have the time or the capacity for some reason to read, then you can't be a stoic. And that applies to any value out there. And Marcus Aurelius tells you that this is nonsense, because in reality, what he's telling you here in this book is from the source. These are principles that all men can apply to themselves. You don't need to read that book. It just comes naturally. Your nature has been repressed by a set of morals. He's trying to give you a new one. But in reality, the set of morals he's giving you is your own divinity exp expressing itself. I did not perceive, at least on certain occasions, but most of the things that Marcus shares with us is pure biological drive, meaning that it truly is a sort of evolutionary philosophy of sorts, because it just makes sense. It's aligned with what works for men and what made society great as a whole. And therefore, you need not worry about learning it. You can just apply it. It's in you. The right thing is in you. And that's important because it allows you to take agency and control of your actions. You're not following the words of Marcus Aurelius or my words. You're following your own God, the God that is within you. Remember that to change your course and to follow any man who can set you right is no compromise of your own freedom. The act is your own, performed on your own impulse and judgment and according to your own understanding. So this I will actually collate to my parasocial video because a lot of people told me, okay, you're telling us not to be fine boys, but technically if we follow what you say, we're being your fine boys. And it's a valid question, but it's, it also correlates to that idea of questioning everything instead of exploring everything. Because if you think about it, if you stop being a fanboy, it means you become critical of everything, including me. So it is by default a good thing. Meaning that the judgment that you recover 
is and cannot, can never be an enemy because it's not tainted, it's your own judgment. And therefore, if you change your mind, it's not a shame. The Stoic changes his mind because he's trying to constantly adapt. He's trying to constantly be able to be of use. What he's not going to be uh, wagering on or changing his mind on is principles that he decided are set in stone because they are too important. But for the rest, changing your mind is not a problem. It's not a sign of weakness. And it's not a loss of freedom either because you did it via your own will. And you, are, you can come back to, from it and you can come back on it with, again, your own will and your own agency. If the doing of this be in your own power, why do it thus? If it be in another's, whom do you accuse? The atoms? The gods? To accuse either is a piece of madness. Therefore, accuse no one. Separate, if you can, the cause of error. If you cannot, correct the result at least. If even that be impossible, what purpose can your accusation serve? Nothing should be done without a purpose. The idea of personal responsibility, which for me is the most critical in this modern world, where almost everyone rejects it to a level or another. You need to claim personal responsibility 100% in good, in bad, in chaos, in order, all the time, because this is what freedom is. It can be comfortable to release your self-responsibility because it means that you are not going to be held accountable for your mistakes. But keep in mind that you are putting your own chains around your neck. You are becoming a slave out of your own volition. That needs to be avoided at all costs. Never complain and never point the finger at someone else. Fix yourself. Don't blame the gods. Fix yourself. The problem is within you, not within your creator. For what end are you formed? For pleasure? Look if your soul can enter this thought. Beautifully written to me. Beautifully written because the hedonistic mind cannot look at itself. Meaning that some people are going to try and rationalize the pursuit of pleasure. But if you tell them, hey, is that really what your heart desires and what makes your heart happy? It's, the answer is no. It makes their body happy, right? They get, they get the jolt of dopamine, but the self is not happy with it. The envelope is, but not the self, not the soul. And that breaks the, the entire idea of pleasure as something worth pursuing. Pleasure is not worth pursuing at all. Pain is not something to avoid. Right? All of these things are simplistic mindsets that need to be pushed aside. This, your suffering, is well merited. For you would rather become good tomorrow than be good today. So the idea of constantly pushing back the betterment and the, the, the moral activity of being your best self. It cannot wait. And it's the same for training, by the way. Oh, I'll start tomorrow. Well, no, you won't. Because starting tomorrow means starting today. You do it now. And that's the same for everything in life. I'll start tomorrow means I will never do it. Might as well not say anything. Because you're lying to yourself now. And you're going to perpetuate a cycle of lying and self-hatred. You want to do it? You have the ability to do it now. Marcus Aurelius tells you that for morals, for anything in life in reality. And that is true. Speak, whether in the Senate or elsewhere, with dignity rather than elegance, and let your words ever be sound and virtuous. So the idea that you want to make, to make sense before you focus on the lyricism. The, le fond pr, uh, prime sur la forme, as we say in my language, meaning that content is more important than form. And of course you want both. If you want to express good ideas, you also need to be able to string words together and make good sentences, elegant sentences. But it doesn't take, uh, it, it, it is not the first step. It is the second step, always. And of course you need to remain sound and virtuous. Tell the truth, your version of the truth. And don't be malicious, don't be intellectually dishonest. These things by default destroy the content of your message. But a lot of people forget that. Uh, a lot of people are just elegant. But when you try and pierce their words, you realize that there's nothing behind. It's empty. It's blank. You don't want to be that person. Receive the gifts of fortune, fortune without pride and part with them without reluctance. Accept the moments where the source and the, the universal chaos is going to bestow upon you some gifts. Accept them. 
don't don't think it's your due just take it and when they leave just let them go it comes and goes never feel special because you receive the talent or something like this it is just going to make your betterment as a person worse you always want to remain humble not for others because who cares about others but for yourself for the soul the soul thus free from patience is a strong thought nor can a man find any stronger to which he can fly and become henceforth invincible the man who has not discerned this is ignorant he who has discerned and flies not theater is miserable so the power of the spirit if i were to relate that to uh, uh, an internet speech of sort uh, an internet metaphor it's the difference between the red pill the blue pill and the black pill the blue pill is someone who doesn't know. He just doesn't know. So he's ignorant. You can't really blame him for that. He just doesn't know. The black pill, however, is worse because he knows, but he refuses to act on it. He prefers to, to just waddle in his own misery because he knows, but he has decided that the, the task is too much. This is the pathetic man because he has the power to take care of, of things and he doesn't. And the red pill is knowing, seeing, and taking actions. And you always want to be that. Do you wish to be praised by a man who curses himself thrice within an hour? Can you desire to please one who is not pleased with himself? Can he be pleased with himself who repents of almost everything he does? Just a description of the black pill mindset, which you can also call nihilism in a sense. Nihilism, which, by the way, is not Nietzsche's philosophy. I know that it's a widespread idea, but he actually spoke against nihilism. But I'll get to that when we actually uh, discuss Nietzsche. And what he said here is that you don't, these people hate themselves. So you cannot expect praise from them. You shouldn't even want praise from people. But from these people, it's not possible for one simple reason. They hate themselves. And therefore, they are an example of what happens when you give up on the divinity. When you just, you just stop growing. Because you eventually grow resentful of yourself and of the wood. That is just a byproduct of it. And this is, a, this is a state that needs to be avoided. He who dreads death, dreads either the, instinct, the extinction of all senses or the experience of a new one. If all sense be extinguished, there can be no sense of evil. If a different sort of sense be acquired, you become a different creature and do not cease to live. So, first off, a beautiful rebunking of atheism, in a sense, because the mindset of, oh, there is no heaven and nothing happens after death. Okay, but then what? What does it mean if nothing happens after death? Because if nothing happens after death, which you cannot prove, then it means that death isn't so scary after all, because it's just the, extin the extinction of senses. But if there is something after death, then you didn't really die. You just moved on to a new path, to a new realm. And therefore, death is not something to be feared. Penetrate into the governing part of others and also allow others to enter into your own. Relevant to my channel, I think. Uh, it's gradually becoming more and more obvious that I'm sharing more of my thoughts. And in a sense, I'm letting you penetrate my mind, a portion of it. And I'm also doing that in reverse, because by saying certain things, I am actually plugging myself into your brain. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship in a sense. But I think it's not, it's not evil, it's not dangerous, because it is social, it is normal. And the fact that I do believe that on a societal level, we have stopped to do that. We have stopped exploring other people's minds. We have stopped showing people who we truly are, for multiple reasons, fear of being judged, etc., we have lost something. That's part of the human experience that we've lost and we need to reclaim it because it's part of society. And it, without it, society is lacking something. And that something is trust. It's the reason why people don't trust each other anymore. You cannot trust someone who wears a mask. It's not possible. Men are often unjust by omissions as well as by actions. Just a simple word to say that Sometimes you feel slighted by someone who didn't even know that they had the ability to slight you. They didn't do it on purpose. It's not really their fault, and therefore you shouldn't get upset at it. It's just a waste of time. Be satisfied with your present opinion. If certain with your present courses of action, 
if so show with your present mood, if well pleased with all that comes upon you from without. So the satisfaction with the present allows the pursuit of the future because people who are ever resentful of what they are now never change because the, the hatred that you have for your, your present self provide, uh, uh, proscribes you from going forward because you're constantly stuck in that spiral. You need to accept your current state, understand that it's not going anywhere, you're not going to regress, and then go forth, just naturally take a step and see where it takes you. Because in reality, the only state in which human, humans live is the present. The past and the future are social inventions. They don't really exist. The only thing that exists is the now. And the now is ever repeating because the now is me speaking to you right now. This is where you need to live. Epicurus says, In my sickness, my conversations were not about the diseases of this poor body, nor did I speak of any such things to those who came to me. This one resonates with me for one simple reason. I have not necessarily a fear of sickness, but I have a fear of ending up in a position where I become pathetic because I have seen it with my own eyes. And therefore, it is important for me to see that a man like Epicurus was able, even on his deathbed, to not let it affect him. Meaning that he did not become his sickness. Too many people become that. They're mentally ill or they have a sickness or anything. And they let it become their identity. But then it devours them. You are not your sickness. You are much more than that. Your sickness is just a tiny thing attached to you. And maybe you ho hopefully I pray that one day it falls. But if it never does it, then just don't let it define your life. Just refuse. Struggle against it. And it can be easy. You know, it can be easy to define yourself with your weaknesses. A lot of people do that. It's because you're hoping for the benevolence of others who are going to console you. But this is a slave morality of sorts. You do not want to be that. You don't want to be a dependent on other people's affection to be able to love yourself. Love yourself fiercely, regardless of what you perceive to be your thoughts. And strive to be better, constantly. Don't let yourself be coddled by others, because it's going to keep you weak. And that was that. That is it for the book. If you have noticed, for the people who have read it, I did not add any portions from book, five, uh, book 10 and 11, because these are much more poetic. They tend to repeat things that I've already mentioned and covered, so I don't want to be too redundant. But I also want to give you a portion of the book that you discover by yourself. I did the same with the Book of Five Rings, the Ayakure. I give you the, the choice and the power to discover portions with your own divinity. But of course, understand that I always encourage you to discover the book by yourself before you listen to me talk about it. And it's the same for the future book because we are done with the meditations. We are going next week to read the Enchiridion, which is a much smaller book. We'll be done with it in no time. But it's, an, uh, it's a, a very necessary introduction to Epictetus' mind because then we're going to cover the discourses which are, which are much longer and you're going to need to be in the right frame of mind and have previous knowledge of it. So it's going to be short, but then I want to give you a little break too from Epictetus. So we're going to then cover the On the Happy Life by Seneca, which is slightly longer. And then we're going to, as I said, do the discourses. So we have three books left on Stoicism. And then we're going to move to what some call nihilism, which is in reality Nietzsche's philosophy. And I'm going to see who I pair with Nietzsche. I might do uh, Jung. We'll see. If you have any ideas of, uh, of themes that would match his philosophy, you can add them. We might just do several books from Nietzsche. We'll see. Uh, depending on, the, depending on the, the vibe and the spirit I get from the first book, if I feel that it needs to be completed, I'm going to try and create a pair, maybe three books. I'm still making it up. We still have a lot of time to spend on Stoicism, so we're not quite there yet. As always, thank you so much for following that portion of The Elite Barbarian focused on the meditation. And let us thank Marcus Aurelius also for all of the wisdom we got. I appreciate you all. Have a good day.